seated. Great job, guys. Praise the Lord. And again, happy Mother's Day. My mama's here in the house. Praise the Lord. Some of you are saying it must be. That's the first time we've seen you in a tie in 25 years. <laughs> so I work for mama, okay? Every once in a while, I'll do something, right? Cheaper than flowers. No. <laughs> that was a joke, okay? Chill out. We're just working on some of your senses of humor. I know it's going to get there. What's that in my glass of water? Housekeeping. <laughs> it is good to see you today. I hope that you're here and hope your mama's with you. If not, I hope you've called her already. Let her know how much you love her. You know, we do celebrate this day of Mother's Day. I, I've always thought it was interesting that we just kind of pull out a day and call it Mother's Day or Father's Day or whatever. But certainly somebody needs a recognition at least more than one day a year. It's got to be moms. Amen. In fact, as we've been in this series on the miracles of Jesus, uh, the miracle we have to deal with in the series of messages that we're dealing with is about a mother and about a mom who's desperate. In fact, just as we sang this song, Rescue, I thought, boy, this was the, pri the, the cry that song was of this, this mother's heart. When we look at her, she was a Canaanite Gentile woman. Remember, the Jews didn't have much to do with the Gentiles and uh, their cultural differences were vast and extreme and their opinions of each other were about the same as, as well. And so this is an interesting story when you get to on the miracles of Jesus. Remember, all these miracles were, were uh, miracles word we like to use in the English language. Literally, it translated their signs. Uh, they were miracles. They were supernatural events. Therefore, we call them miracles. But more than that, they were, they were, they were signs that, that declared that, and testified that Jesus is Messiah, that he's the Lord that he's the son of David, that he's come to, uh, to, to be the Lord and Messiah and the Christ. And so all these give direction to that. And we've even talked about in the context of the miracles and how they appear, how, how the different messages are there. Beyond just the miraculous, there's, there's a lesson. There's a message for us there. And I really believe that uh, there's one here today because in a moment when I read this story about this, this, uh, this, this miracle, which is part nine in our series from Matthew 15, I've called it the marks of a great mother. Uh, and I think that's an appropriate title. But as I've looked at this and, I, and I've, I've looked at it, uh, in fact, just reading it through, maybe if you first time you ever read the miracle, you think, boy, J Jesus guy, he's pretty insensitive. Because it, as the story progresses, you know that this woman comes to Jesus and he just ignores her. Now, before you think that Jesus is just kind of mean like that, understand we have already seen from the miracles that we've talked about and the context of these miracles, that Jesus knew the hearts and the minds of all people. There's no surprises here, all right, that he, he knows who this woman is, and he knows what's going on, and there's something that he's getting to here. And this miracle is recorded in the Word of God for our benefit as well. So that there's some things that we can glean from it, and things that we need to learn from it as well. So don't, don't miss that, Mark. So if it looks like, as we read this, that there's a bit of insensitivity on the Lord Jesus, or we know he is... Uh, uh, is, is, is someone who is, can never be described as insensitive. So let's, let's look at the scriptures as we look at this particular miracle. It says in Matthew 15, 21, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan, this is a Gentile woman of Canaan, came from that region and cried out to him, saying, as we said, well, rescue me. Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon possessed. Maybe you felt that way about your daughter. I don't know. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him saying, please get rid of this woman. <laughs> That's why you can almost say it. She is, thinks she's bothering you. Now she's coming after us. Well, as, as it goes, but he answered and said, not to them, but to her. I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she came and she worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, but even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered and said to her, O oh, woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. Now this, is a, this really is a, it's a, it's a great story. It's, it's a great incident in time and history. Please don't think it's a fairy tale. This, this actually happened. 
And I, I don't know what it's like as, uh, as this mother comes. She comes. She has a daughter who's, who's terribly ill. We, we don't know what the manifestations are of this demon possession. We read through the New Testament lots of things that happen when demon possessed from everything from throwing yourself into the fire to cutting yourself to all the, the self-inflicted wounds and uh, the crying and the, 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 uh, the unhappiness and the anger that comes forth from someone who's, who's severely demon possessed like this. And uh, she's, a, she's a woman, obviously, who's driven. She's, 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 she's not going to be content with anything less than an answer. She, she, she's looking for the answer. Obviously, she's heard about the Lord Jesus, if not witnessed already some of the things. He, we know he's casting out demons. We know he's, he's healing the sick. And he is, by the way, through every one of these miracles, the Lord over all these things. He, he is the Lord over demons. He's the Lord over sickness and infirmities. He's the Lord over the wind and the waves and the storms and the trials. He, I mean, you put it simply, he's the Lord over all things. And she recognizes this by the very way that she comes and, and speaks to him and, and deals with him. That He's the one who can get the same things done. So I, I've kind of gone through this and gleaned some things, what I might call the seven marks of, of great mothers. Uh, if you uh, perhaps you would classify your own mom in this category that I think that these seven things are things that, you can identify in her life and perhaps as a mother today, you would say, well, these are some lofty goals, you know, that I, I certainly want to obtain and, and, you know, arrive at my own heart, my own life and my own family with my own children. So let's look at these about great mothers in this regard about overcoming all great barriers. Here's this woman. Remember, she overcomes the wall of inferiority first. She's a woman. It's interesting that, you know, here's, a, here's a, this woman in need. She's not a Jewish woman. She, she just says she's a Canaanite Gentile woman. She's got to get past this barrier, especially with a Jewish man who, uh, other than Jesus, would have nothing to do with her like the woman at the well, all right? Would have nothing for that half-breed kind of woman there, part Gentile, part Jew. Certainly nobody's going to speak to her, but there's Jesus, amen? And he's offering her the gift of life and he's offering her the water of life. And here's this woman who's this Gentile woman. And again, as she comes, she's, she's got to over, overcome some issues here. And she struggles past this, this first barrier, this kind of, a, this, it's, in fact, it's almost with the attitude of the silence of Jesus, like, well, you know, uh, you don't have a place here. And perhaps even in her own mind, because we know how the flesh works and we know how Satan works. She's dealing with this issue. Well, you're not really good enough or you're not the right person. In fact, she has to cross that. And she has to cross the, what we'd call the sea of anonymity. She is a Gentile. Maybe you've even felt in your own life, well, I don't measure up and I really not good enough. And there's really no way that I, that I, that I can approach, but she just presses past all those things. And she climbs what we call the mountain of diversity. She's not a Jew. But yet she's coming to a Jewish man, the Jewish Savior, the Jewish Messiah. So she presses past all these barriers. That's a sign of a great woman in reality. She comes and she presses past all these issues of maybe I don't measure. I mean, how many times maybe as a mom you've heard that? I've dealt especially with young moms and even uh, my own wife, when she was a, a young mom and we had those first baby in the house and dealing with all those kind of things that come up, uh, Kathy would be in the other room feeling really down. I just don't think I, you know, I can do this. And of course, you never felt that way as a mother, have you? Especially in those other days. You know, they don't come with a lot of instruction, do they? Babies, that is, not mothers. Mothers are hard enough to figure out themselves. But throw a baby in there, amen? She overcomes the barriers, but also she is empowered by something. She's driven by something. And I believe it's her love for her child. She loves her daughter. She doesn't want to see her suffering the way that she's suffering. Isn't it interesting that when our families suffer and mothers have children that are suffering, how often have you just want to say, I, I want to take that from you. Let me take that on. And it just doesn't work that way though, does it? So she's driven at this point. She's empowered. By, in fact, it's, her love is, is more powerful than her fear about this situation of approaching Jesus. And there's a lot of fear most likely in her heart. In fact, her love is more powerful than, than her shame of being on the outside and not being a part of the so-called inner circle of the, Jewish, of the Jewish people. But her life drives her past that. Her concern for her daughter drives her past that. In fact, her love is, is more powerful than all the hardships and all the issues she has to deal with and all the shame that's involved. She, she just goes past those issues. In fact, too many mothers, I think, and too many people, not just mothers, can sometimes be controlled by 
fear and shame or doubt and what abouts and what if I, and, and, and these things seem to be paralyzing, but the love becomes the focus. This daughter and the passion she has as a, as a mother for a daughter is the focus. It's not, you know, the inferiority. It's not the, the, the being not of the right cultural. It's not being of the right gender. She just presses past these things. As, there's a need here that's greater than all these things. In fact, love is greater and stronger than all these things. Even scriptures teach that, that love, perfect love, cast out all fear. And so she's motivated and she's driven by this, this love that she has, all right? And it's, it's more powerful than how difficult the situation might be or the hardship might be or even the sacrifices that might have to be made. And there are multitudes of sacrifices that have to be made if you're going to be the kind of mother that God would have you to be and to demonstrate the kind of love that God would have you demonstrate and to show the kind of love that's in your heart for your children. But she's empowered by that. The third thing about these great moms is that they're armed with great determination. I mean, nothing's going to stop her here. And I want to look, at, look at what she has to press through because there's certainly a lot of issues she has to press through. She's going to get to the Jewish Messiah, to Jesus. First of all, there's this issue of patience. It says Jesus did not answer her. And a lot of people at that point just, you know, they kind of quit. I think people have done that in their prayer life even. You know, they, God didn't answer me, so that's it. I, you know, I, I guess I'll just deal with this my own, get through it my own. So this, this, it, this test of divine silence when she, he doesn't answer. And then add to it, the disciples are kind of, kind of chiming in here and she has to, you know, conquer that, send her away mentality. You're, too, you're, you're a problem. You're, 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 you're harassing the master. She gets past the discouragement of that. And she gets past the doubt of that. She keeps moving. And then add to that. I mean, number one's bad enough. Most, you know, if people ignore you most of the time, you're done with it, right? Yeah. But there's some greater need than her ego here. There's some greater need than, than, than her acceptance within the, the group around her. There's a need that's driving her. And so she presses past that. And then she has to get past when Jesus does speak to her. I'm not here for you. Hello. <laughs> and again, Jesus, he knows exactly what's going on. There is a lesson he's trying to teach us here. He's not about to reject this woman at this point in time. It becomes obvious when you read the story that in his wisdom and it, that he's, 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 he's giving us a, an eternal lesson. He's teaching his disciples. He's making a very important point. He's already, we've talked about in some of the miracles, said that they're going to come from the east and the west. All the nations are going to come and worship him. So you kind of have to go with, you know, what's, what's consistent through scripture and see that there's something else that's going on here. And so as he speaks to her, he says, you know, well, you know, you, I was sent only to the house of Israel. It's not good to give uh, the dogs, uh, you know, the food that's meant for the children of Israel. So she works past it. She keeps moving. She conquered the test of, of humbleness. You say, what do you mean? How'd you like to be called the dog? <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that would give you a good reference to the whole situation, make you feel better about everything. Make you feel real positive and energized by the whole scenario. I don't think so. But it, it, it's, it, these are all the issues, whether you're a woman or a man, that you're going to have to get over, Amen. all right, if you're going to get to God. You're going to have to get over these things about who you are. I know we're living in the world where everybody's special. <laughs> yeah. Everybody gets a trophy. Everybody gets a sucker or a lottie pop or whatever. Everybody wins. The Bible says a little different story. You know, that we're not all special. In fact, the Bible says that we're all sinners. And the only way we'll ever be saved is by grace. Yeah, God loves each and every one of us, all right? Because we're made in his image. God loves us. He cares about us. He demonstrated it by sending his own son. But understand, that love is in spite of the fact of what we've done. In spite of the fact of what we are without Christ in our life. We need a savior. She's not about to argue with this. In fact, the day I came to Christ, you know, if, if I, I pretty much agree with the fact I'm a mess. I've wrecked my life. I've made a mess of things. I need help. So she, she gets past it because she really sees the issue here. And there's a constant barrage of these kind of things that come to all of us. And I believe especially to mothers. And somebody, somebody ought to take a little time and recognize that. But I will say this at the same time. When you as a person realize there's a need here that's driving you, which was this mother and her daughter, those are not real issues. You're going to drive on past them. 
because it's not about you. And she, she recognizes in this moment there's something greater going on here and here's the one who can resolve the issue. And by the way, in the world we live in, as mothers, fathers, whatever, and especially moms, you realize that if you're, you are a child of God, God has given you everything you need to deal with the silence, to deal with the guilt, to deal with the shame, to deal with the rejection. God's given you everything you need. That you're complete in Christ and you can press forward in faith. Here's a woman without all that background. She's start beginning to have some spiritual insight because obviously I think the Holy Spirit, the Bible says it's the Holy Spirit that draws us, amen. That no man comes to Christ at the Spirit, that she's drawn and God's doing, ready to do a work in this woman's life so she's come, you know, the right place. But God gives you the ability as well to deal with these kind of issues in your life. But also the fourth thing about great mothers is they know the power of great prayer. She came to the greatest resource for the problem that she had. In fact, I, I love the way it writes it because it's on more than one occasion, she, you see her coming with this attitude of worship. She, she, on a couple of verses here, she calls him Lord, Lord, Lord. She, she, she comes with a confession to who he is. No doubt in her mind, she's seen the signs. She's read the signs that were clear to her. So we said all these miracles are signs. She's heard of them. She's seen them. Perhaps she's witnessed some of these signs. So she's coming to acknowledge the one who is greater than all things, who is the Lord. And she, and in fact, doesn't it say that when, when he said, I have not come except for the house of Israel, what's her response? Verse says she worships him. She acknowledges his lordship. She, she calls on him. She knows she knows here that, that he's the answer from whom you can, that, that he's the source to get the right answer from by calling him Lord. And it's more than just one. She calls him Lord on several occasions here. Yes, Lord, Lord, Lord. She acknowledges. She's moving forward. She, she comes to this place where now she, she admits she can't even manage her life without God. She says, I need help. I can't do what needs to be done. I can't fix the problems. I can't resolve this issue. There are things in my life that are bigger than me. That's the mark of a great woman who realizes not that she just can't do it, but she realizes where she can get the help, where she can find what she needs, where she can find the grace, where she can find the strength and the support and the courage and the life that she needs and sometimes even the love that she needs. So here she is. She, she's moving forward and this all has to do about, you know, about her... Her, uh, her request, it's, it's like intercession. She's praying, she's worshiping. She wants, she's asking and she's appealing for God to do something, I need help. And then she confessed that she needed, she needed God personally. Help me, help. Gets down to the source. In fact, let me tell you this, if you follow this story and you study this a little closer, you realize that all of a sudden she, is, she has discovered the greatest, the greatest asset that any woman can have, prayer. I can talk to God about this. I can get with God about this. And he's not ignoring me. We are his children. In the Bible, even Jesus later gives the story about the unjust judge and the woman who's appealing and she can't get her need met because this, justice, this judge is unjust, but she keeps persisting to finally the judge res resigns to it and says, okay, I'll meet the need. And Jesus uses that parable, but he's not using it in, in a comparison where God's like an unjust judge. You've got to keep begging. He, it's, it's, a, it's a parable of, and a story of contrast. That what he's saying is that your heavenly father is not like an unjust judge. So when you appeal to him, and repeatedly if necessary, when you appeal to him, he hears you. He's moving. Things are happening. So she confesses that what she needs is something from God and the grace of God and she moves toward God and she realizes that, this, that she's come ultimately to the right source. Number five, she acknowledged her, her own great spiritual needs. She admits in this moment that she's, she's not worthy being a sinner before God. When he says, you're Gentile, you're not Israel, you're not the promised children of God, she agrees, I'm not. I admit it. I wasn't born that way. I wasn't raised that way. I haven't been, in, I haven't been in, invited into that way. Uh, I'm just a sinner before God. Think about it is, you know, she has enough humility in her life to acknowledge it, you know, without God's help here. She doesn't have any recourse. She has no answer. She's just helpless. 
Now, too often, it's, it's almost like we have to be boxed into something before we get to this place of acknowledgement. And this, this is beautiful. She, she, she only asked for grace and mercy at the master's table. Just the crumbs will be fine. Because, hey, the crumbs from the table of heaven are far better than the biggest banquet the devil could ever lay out for you. The bread of life, even the crumbs of the bread of life, are far greater and more nutritious and life-giving and life-fulfilling than anything of turning to the world and its answers are ever going to find you. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is who she's pressing to. And she's realizing in the middle of all this, uh, probably the greatest lesson we need to learn other than realizing that prayer is the ultimate weapon for victory, she's realizing that humility is the, is the real key. Getting humble before God is the key to great. And I believe this is part of the lesson the disciples are supposed to be getting and that we're supposed to be getting, that you can come to the Father. And he is a God of mercy and he is a God of grace. But when you come, you come humbly. You come with a, with a heart uh, of humility before God and realizing, hey, that humility becomes the key to real greatness. The Bible says, you know, that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, that he lifts up the humble. You draw nigh to him in humility, then he'll draw nigh to you. We will willing to acknowledge our spiritual need. The great moms in life have realized that the answer is found in the Lord, and the way to do that is through humility and faith and prayer. The triumph, number six, I love this. They triumph because of a great faith. I mean, if you look at everything, you see the evidence of her love that she has for her daughter and the determination that she has in her life and the source to who she's going to, you realize that there's a great deal of faith that's involved here. And so she receives this commendation from the Lord. And this is where he's going. He sees this in her heart, remember, from the beginning. You have a great faith. Why is it so great? Because her faith is in the great God. Her faith is in the great mercy. Her faith is in the great grace of God. And God is merciful and God is gracious. And so she's believing God for that. So she's pressing through all the obstacles, all the barriers, all the hindrances, all the rejections. She keeps moving right forward to it. Because of it, she received, you know, that this, this approval. And how is the approval manifest? Well, your request is granted. Can't beat that deal, can you? What you've been asking for. It's taken care of. What you wanted for your daughter is done. What you are seeking from me and what you demonstrated such faith in of going past every obstacle that was thrown in your way, your request is granted. Now, obviously, the great miracle was that was, was what she received, that her daughter, the Bible says, her daughter was healed in that moment. Now, that's a good Mother's Day. <laughs> Amen? Amen. That's a glorious reward. And so she comes with this heart of humility. She comes with this heart of faith. And guess what happens? She's pressing through. I, I thought that scripture that, you know, it says, uh, uh, the, uh, when it talks about pressing forward and pressing on, it says, you know, that uh, it said, we shall reap in due season if we faint not. There's no fainting here. I mean, this is guerrilla warfare for mothers. Amen. This is the battleground for mothers. And she demonstrates. And as a demonstration, she presses forward in faith and believes God. And the reward of that is, is what she saw, what she was seeking God for, what she wanted to believe God for was that of her daughter. And in fact, I believe the same is true in all of our lives. We are always, especially moms in so many ways in family regards, are always met with obstacles, mountains to be moved, oceans to be crossed, death, depths to be swam. And you have to come to this place to realize that I can't do this, but God can. And everything is thrown upon him and you trust him for who he is. And in due season, if you don't pass out, if you don't give up, if you don't quit, if you don't retire, if you don't faint, in due season, you will receive. Number seven. This thought this was interesting about the story. I couldn't find her name anywhere. Her, her name's not written out. I read in the story several times, read it again twice this morning now and you know. She doesn't have a name. But great mothers don't need the fame. They don't need the celebrity status. They don't need to be the greatest American Idol mother. It's not necessary. In fact, if you look at her, she's just a poor Canaanite woman. I mean, she ain't, she ain't got anything to bring. She can't buy any help. She's an outcast 
of the nation of Israel. She's a Gentile. In fact, on top of that, she's a Canaanite. Remember, the Jews drove out the Canaanites. She doesn't have a name. Now, I'm sure she had a name, but the Lord didn't give us a name. But she was elevated among the greats of God, even though there was no name given. And there's several people like that in Scripture. You don't see their name. Like the woman who cast her money into the treasury, you know what? The little bit that she had, the widow, just nothing. She threw it in. And Jesus is demonstrating to his disciples about great faith. And he said, well, look at her. She put in more than everybody. Didn't give us her name. But she does realize the greatest name is standing in front of her. The name above all names. The name of Jesus. The name that is that strong and mighty power that we run to. The name that causes demons to tremble. The name that's been given to us whereby we can be saved, the scripture says. That all men can be saved through the name of Jesus. The name, the person, the Lord Jesus Christ is the only name she needs. Now, I believe that, <clears throat> that when we get to heaven, we'll, we'll probably know who she is. In fact, I would, I would trust that there's going to be some women gathered around her when they get to heaven. If for these ages that have already gone by since this event have not already gone to her and said, hey, I got to talk to you, sister. Because what you did and how you persevered and the dogged determination that you demonstrated, that story, your testimony was just what I needed to hear at a certain time in my life. It's just, what you did was so encouraging for me in my life, I don't think I would have made it if I hadn't heard that story and your testimony. She's real. And you'll see one day how real she is. But the issue is really right here and now, isn't it? Will we be real? Don't give up. I know that there are times when you pray about things and you see issues and it just looks like all is done. It's over. It's hopeless. It's not over till God says it's over. Amen. Doesn't have anything to do with any fat lady singing either. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It's just when the Lord says it's done and not until. Don't put your faith in what you see because many times when you're pressing heaven for answers that demon-possessed child is throwing fits over in the corner. Amen? I think you understand what I'm saying. But in the right moment, in the sovereignty of God, and this one thing I see about these miracles we go through, is all about the sovereignty of God. In the right time, in the right place, in the right testimony is given, the right grace is going to be manifest. And things are going to happen if we press on and we do not faint. I'll, I'll be honest with you, you know, uh, my mother being here today, six kids. I had two. My hair's still falling out. All right? Six kids. How much time I just spend praying for two? Can you imagine praying for six? And then she, out of her, her insanity, she married a man who had six kids. I don't know, do you know math? That's 12. Twelve. You want to put a name in this passage? You can just put Patricia. All right. That, that works for me today. It might be you could put your mama's name in there today. Amen. That your mom demonstrated these seven qualities of what it means to be a great mom. Pressed on, determined, prayed, believed, and seized the reward. What a great testimony and what a great encouragement for us. In fact, it is so good... I hope you chew on it some today. Amen. I want you to stand with your heads bowed. We're not going to give an invitation this morning.